and we are recording should be about now okay all right i think we are recording now um let's talk about this thing called the scientific method we already talked about this on friday I was talking about the way of formulating hypotheses and then putting them through some sort of test. And the power of that approach is that it makes science self-correcting. Uh, science usually does not get things right uh, the first time. There's a whole long history of really, really good ideas that simply just turned out not to hold water. Um, I have met dumb scientists. I've met bigots. Uh, I've even seen cases of frauds and crooks. Uh, I was just reading this morning about a uh, German guy, I think his name was Dr. Schoen, who'd made a discovery that could have led to impossibly fast computers. It was a new design of trans of um, a new design of uh, transistor uh, that unfortunately turned out to be a fraud. And it he ended up wasting a lot of people's time with a discovery that turned out to be fake. And even good scientists make mistakes. It happens all the time. I've made plenty in my day. But science itself is self-correcting. Hypotheses get tested. Even well-established theories you know, hypotheses that have been very, very well tested, sometimes turns out they were not well tested enough. And even pet ideas like that may have to be modified or ultimately torn down. And, you know, even frauds might take people in for a while, but eventually they get exposed and eventually they get, uh, they get dropped. And this goes on all the time, um, whether you're aware of it or not. So I want to talk a little bit more about how you test hypotheses. And let's say I wanted to take, test a hypothesis that taking certain pills cures COVID-19. Uh, let's say that pill is, what was it, hydroxyquinone, or whatever it was that people were talking about taking. Or, you know, let's say it's bleach or something like that. Taking some treatment cures COVID-19. So let's say I take a bunch of people who have COVID-19 and they take the pills and they all get better. Now, most people do recover from COVID-19, at least to a degree. I mean, we know now that there could be lasting side effects, but it still doesn't kill close to half of the people that get it. Most people will make some kind of recovery. So just because I get a bunch of people to take my miracle pills, and they all recover from COVID-19 doesn't mean that the pills are doing any good because they might well have recovered anyway. And this is an example of what we call the post hoc fallacy, which is short for the Latin phrase post hoc ergo propter hoc, uh, which means after it, therefore because of it. That's the assumption that if one thing happens, and then a second thing happens, the first thing caused the second. And this is a mistake, because if one thing happens and then the second thing happens, yeah, maybe the first could be causing the second, but it could also be a coincidence, or both could be caused by a third factor that you're not aware of. Just because two things go together does not automatically mean that one is causing uh, the other. And that's a, so that's a logical mistake. Another way of saying the same thing is correlation is not the same thing as causality. The point of doing an experiment and designing it in the proper way is that you can test whether X really did cause Y. You don't just blindly assume it uh, because these two things happen to go together. That's the point of doing a formal experiment. Let me show you what I mean by the post hoc fallacy 
uh, 538.com started out as a, um, you know, website that discusses presidential races and polls and things like that. Uh, but in between presidential elections, they talk a lot about statistics and things like that. And uh, they took surveys within their own offices, you know, about 40 people working in the office. And they found that if you get lots and lots of people to list all of the things that they prefer, they found that drinking coffee correlates with cat ownership. Uh, if you drink coffee, you are more likely than average to own a cat. Um, eating bananas correlates with higher SAT verbal scores. If you eat bananas, on average, you're likelier to have a higher SAT verbal than if you don't. Uh, but eating potato chips correlates with higher SAT math. Eating egg rolls correlates with a greater likelihood that you'll own a dog. And eating cabbage correlates with having an innie navel, you know, a belly button that sticks inward rather than protrudes uh, outward. And if you look hard enough, if you just gather enough facts about the kinds of things that people prefer and about, you know, factors in their lifestyle, you can always find connections like this purely just due to random chance. You know, the odds that, you know, more banana eaters will own cats than own dogs is maybe it's low, but it's not zero. There's always a chance you'll find something like this, but it doesn't really mean anything. So those are correlations, but there's no evidence of causality at all. Uh, no evidence that eating cabbage will cause your navel to start shrinking inwards. Uh, there's actually an, uh, never mind, that's not really a good joke. I'll show you a more serious example. There's two things that are correlated. One of them is getting vaccines in childhood. And most vaccines are given when a child is between 12 and 18 months. This also happens to be about the age at which children with autism are going to start showing their first symptoms uh, somewhere in that time frame. And so the two often happen at the same time. Children are often diagnosed with autism at about their time they're getting their childhood vaccines. There are parents who have gone out, gotten their kids vaccinated, and next week the kids are starting to show signs of autism. The two do happen at the same time, and some parents have concluded that childhood vaccines do cause autism. But the mistake they're making is correlation is not causality because vaccines and autism symptoms happen in the same time frame. By itself, that is not nearly enough to say that one is causing the other. Um, the latest big study that they made, um, I think they looked at pretty much the entire uh, children's population of Denmark uh, actually showed that there is no causality. There's no evidence at all that vaccines cause autism. But even if I didn't know that, we could say that we can't jump to the conclusion that vaccines cause autism just because the two tend to happen at about the same time. So that is a, you know, issue that's very important to many people. It's, you know, one you hear about on social media in anti-vax communities and things like that. But that part of the argument that these two things happen together, therefore one causes the other, that's a mistake. That's a logical fallacy. So how can you get to where you can start inferring causation? Uh, when does one thing really cause another? you do it by designing a formal experiment. Experiments don't have to be done in the lab. Uh, they don't have to be done with fancy equipment. You have probably already done more experiments than you realize. Uh, 
and it goes a little like this. Let's say you're observing something. Um, many different factors could be affecting what you see. Uh, the slide says, going back to the church study, that actually refers to some slides that I deleted. Uh, but let's say, you know, we're looking at risk of a child developing autism. Now, a lot of things could influence that. Maybe your genes, you know, what you inherit from your parents has something to do with your risk of autism. Um, maybe there's something about lifestyle that influences whether you get autism. Maybe there's something about, you know, nutrition that influences it. I don't know. I'm not a specialist in this. But there could be lots of different things that influence whether you get autism. Uh, there could be lots of different factors that influence your risk of um, dying from COVID. Uh, maybe some people just are genetically more likely. Uh, maybe some people get different strains. Maybe some people uh have other risk factors there's lots of things that can affect the outcome of covid infection or of any disease if you're designing an experiment well you're going to isolate only one of those factors and we call that the independent variable once you've done that you can design your experiment in such a way that you isolate the effect of the independent variable on the thing that you're trying to study, the thing you observe, which is the dependent variable. And let me show you an example. I think this will be a little bit clearer uh, if we take this and, you know, and root it. There's a rooted example. That was a, that was a joke. Uh, so that's a picture of some prairie in Arkansas. Uh, this is not UCA's nature reserve, but in about June, it'll look like this. Uh, so that's some Arkansas prairie in summer with everything in bloom. And you'll notice there's a bunch of different types of flower. Uh, I can see a uh, yellow cone flower in the center. Uh, there's some purple cone flower over to the right. I'm seeing some Queen Anne's lace down at the bottom. Uh, looks like there's some grasses. Uh, there's a bunch of purple flowers that I cannot clearly see. Um, there's a whole bunch of different types of plant, right? Uh, there are different sizes, different shapes. You know, some have flowers and some don't. Some have broad leaves and some have narrow leaves. Uh, they're all exposed to different amounts of light. You know, the tall ones are getting full sunlight and the short ones are, you know, probably getting shadowed a bit because the tall plants are throwing shade. Um, they're not necessarily all growing in exactly the same type of soil. Maybe there are some patches of soil that are more rich or more poor or more full of clay or less clayey or something like that. Um, you know, maybe some of them are getting a little more water than others. Maybe some are growing in a slightly low spot that collects water and others aren't. Uh, so every one of these plants is different. They're not only different species of plants, they're growing under slightly different conditions. All of those differences would be considered variables. Um, you know, the species of plant, the amount of sun, the length of daylight, the amount of light, the amount of water, probably dozens of things I can't even think of right now. Those are all variables. They're all things that influence the way these plants are growing. Let's say I wanted to do a botanical experiment. Um, okay, sorry, just admitted somebody who uh, just showed up. Um, yeah, just so you know, if you come in late uh, and I've got the slide on full screen, I may or may not see it in time. 
Um, so good reason to try to be here on time if you can. I won't lock anybody out, but I may not realize that you're uh, standing outside the door as it were. Okay, so if I wanted to study these plants and figure out why they grow and what might be helping them grow, I'd have a very complicated situation. What we've got here is a couple of botanists doing something called a common garden experiment. Each one of these square plots of ground that you see that's surrounded with, you know, a strip of, I guess that's aluminum, uh, has plants growing in it, as you see. The plants are all of the same species, and they're all growing in as close to identical conditions as it's possible to make them. Uh, they're growing in the same soil. Uh, they're growing with the same amount of light. Uh, they're growing with the same amount of water. Uh, you can see maybe there's a garden hose in this picture that shows, you know, they're all being, you know, the amount of water they're getting is being monitored very carefully. Uh, the plants, again, are all the same species of plant. You're not growing, you know, grasses and oak trees together. So all those plants are growing under conditions as identical as we can reasonably make them. The one thing that you would test is the effect of the independent variable on the dependent variable. Um, if we wanted to test the hypothesis that fertilizer increases growth of plants, we could grow a bunch of identical plots like this, identical squares with the same kind of plant in them under identical conditions, except the one thing we could change would be the amount of fertilizer that's present. So one of these squares might be plants with no fertilizer and another might have, you know, a very small amount and another one might have 10 times that and another one might have 100 times that, uh, however you would set it up. So the only difference between these plots is the amount of fertilizer that the plants are getting. That's the independent variable. The dependent variable would be some measurement of how much the plants are growing. Uh, you might measure the height of the plants or the weight of the plants or the amount of weight gained by the plants after such and such a length of time. Uh, you'd measure something like that and what you actually measure would be your dependent variable. So let's go through this again. Your hypothesis is that you know, secret fertilizer X27 boosts the growth of plants. That's your hypothesis. The test is you set up a bunch of common plots of ground and you make them as identical as you can and you grow plants in there that are all the same species. They are as identical as you can get. And the only thing that you let differ between those square plots of ground is the amount of fertilizer that you're, get, that you're adding. That's the independent variable. Once your plants are grown, you'd go out and you'd measure how much growth you had, maybe plant height or plant weight or something like that. That is your dependent variable. And you would look for evidence that the dependent variable changed based on the independent variable. If the plots that got fertilizer showed more growth and the plots that got less fertilizer showed less growth, then you could say that we have, um, we've got a much better case for causality if you can show that, if you can show that there's a correlation between a carefully defined independent variable and a dependent variable. I'll go back one. If we were testing drugs or vaccines, which has been in the news a lot over the past year, you hear a lot about drug trials, um, this past summer, there was a lot in the news about trials of uh, hydroxyquinone as something that would cure COVID. 
uh, turned out not to. Um, you've heard a lot about the vaccine trials that have gone on and are still going on. Those follow exactly the same pattern. When people tested the vaccines that are slowly coming out, um, instead of plants in a plot of ground, they took groups of people and one group of people didn't get the vaccine, one group of people did, and they looked to see if the group of people that didn't get the vaccine got sick more often than the group of people that did. Now, you can't make groups of identical people because we can't clone people yet, um, but they did try to match the groups to make them as similar as they possibly could. And to add to that a little bit, a good experiment is going to use what we call controls. And that's a part of an experiment in which the variable that's being tested is left alone. So if you're testing fertilizer, your control group is the plants that get no fertilizer at all. The experimental groups would be the ones that did get fertilizer. If we're talking about clinical trials for a vaccine, the control group is the people that don't get the vaccine and the experimental groups would be the people that do get the vaccine. And then you could divide it further by saying, okay, we'll have a control group of people that does not get the vaccine and one experimental group that gets only one injection and a second experimental group that gets two injections um, and so on. You might have more than one experimental group. But the point is that you compare the control group with the experimental group by altering the independent variable and only the independent variable, uh, nothing else. Now, as I've said, when you are testing a drug or a vaccine on humans, it's not practical to make the control and the experimental group identical. Uh, the only way you could really do that would be to recruit a whole bunch of identical twins and put one of each twin in the control and one in the experimental group. And you can't really practically do that. What you would do is make the control and the experimental group as much like each other as possible. Um, you might make sure that both of them contain the same mix of ages, races, um, state of health, any other factor like that. You know, if your control group consists of 90-year-old people uh, with none of their organs in working condition, and your experimental group consists of healthy and fit 20-year-olds, well, that's going to bias your results, right? You'll probably get more people in the control group of 90-year-olds dying than you would get in the experimental group of healthy 25-year-olds, but that doesn't mean that your treatment is good, right? You have to make the control and the experimental group as much like each other as you can. This can sometimes lead to the need for further work. My department head, Dr. Hill, uh, when he's not running the department, he is a specialist in uh, heart function. Uh, he used to do experiments with live pig hearts that he'd get from the uh, Tennessee Pride Slaughterhouse, a uh, couple of towns uh, down. And one of the things he was working on is the fact that a number of drugs that treat the heart were only tested on men. And it turns out that there are slight differences, nothing enormous, but enough that it's of medical interest in the ways that some of those drugs work on men versus uh, women. Uh, a number of the drugs were originally tested only on men uh, because, remember, you want to minimize the effect of all of the other variables other than your independent variable, uh, so they weren't tested on a very diverse cross-section of people. 
And that means that what you really need to do is go back and do the experiment again with other types of people. And that's one of the things that he was working on. Uh, there are some drugs that, I can't think of any good examples right now, uh, but there are some drugs that play out slightly differently in people of different races and ethnicities. Uh, if a drug was tested only on people of European descent, there is a chance it might not work quite the way as advertised if you give it to people of other genetic backgrounds. Um, and that means you really should go back and test it over again. Um, and sometimes this hasn't been done. So lots of things you have to keep in mind when you're setting up experiments like that. So in our clinical trial, I would divide a group of test subjects into two groups. All of them would have COVID-19. One group would get Dr. Wagner's miracle cure. The other group would get nothing. And so our independent variable is whether or not people got the miracle cure. What we would then do is measure how often people in both groups got COVID-19. That's the dependent variable. And if there was a difference between the rate of the um, recovery of COVID-19, if there was a difference between the two groups, then we might be able to say that Dr. Wagner's miracle cure is actually effective. If there was no difference, then we would reject our hypothesis. We would reject the hypothesis that Dr. Wagner's miracle cure cures COVID-19. Okay, I'm assuming that your jaws are just hitting the floor with the great beauty of this scheme. So if the people who got the miracle cure got over their illness faster than those that didn't, we would have confirmed this hypothesis. Um, and that raises the question of just how much faster does recovery have to be? Uh, we'll actually look at this a little bit in lab. Uh, the heavy math will all be done for you, but you'll see some examples of how we use uh, statistical methods of mathematics. Uh, to try to decide whether or not a difference between groups is really significant or not. Uh, we talk a lot about statistical significance, whether a difference between groups is large enough that we can be confident in putting it down to the effect of the independent variable. And again, we would have to match our experimental and control groups as closely as possible you know, if everyone in the control group is over 90 and everyone in the experimental group is 25, then that's not a fair test. Right, same if everybody in the control group um, smokes four packs of cigarettes a day and everyone in the, ex in the experimental group is a, um, a vegan living on pure air in the Rocky Mountains or something like that. That would not be a fair test. So you have to match the experimental and control groups as closely as you can. One of the problems that you run into is something we call the placebo effect. In clinical trials, people have been found to not only feel better, but get better if they think they're getting an effective medicine. Uh, this was first noticed in World War II. Uh, there was an army medic who was treating a lot of wounded soldiers and ran out of morphine, ran out of the painkiller. Um, in desperation, he started injecting patients with pure water and telling them it was morphine. Turns out that the patients who got his water injections actually felt better. Their pain went down, uh, their swelling went down, um, they recovered better, even though they'd only gotten pure water, something that was not supposed to work, something that has no way of working. And the reason is that if you're dealing with testing treatments on people, 
a very important variable, maybe the most important of all, is the patient's state of mind. Your mind has a lot more effect on how you feel and on your state of health than you might be aware that it does. So if I have a bunch of patients with COVID and some of them I completely ignore and some of them I give a pill to, the people who got the pill are likely to feel better because that pill was given to them by a very intelligent person in a white lab coat that we're culturally conditioned to see as a helper. So yeah, if you get a treatment that, you know, you know if you get sugar pills or, you know, salt water injections or something like that, there's no way they could do any good. But if you're getting them from someone who you think knows what they're doing and is able to help you, you are very likely to feel better, even if the treatment that you get has no effect at all. And a treatment like that, that has no effect, but makes you feel better because of the effect of your mind, a treatment like that is called a placebo. For those of you keeping score at home, placebo happens to be Latin for I please. Uh, I am pleasing, placebo. For the record, I will periodically um, explain what various scientific words mean in Greek or Latin. I will never ever test you on this. You don't have to memorize the meanings of these terms. The reason I do it is that if you do know some of these meanings, it can help you learn the vocabulary. It may be a little bit easier for you to remember placebo. Um, it may be a little easier for you to learn vocabulary in other courses, uh, maybe in other fields. Um, now that I, you know that placebo has something to do with pleasing, maybe you'll be able to remember words like placid, for example. Um, so this is there that overall, I think it helps people get a handle on the vocabulary, but I will never test you. What does placebo mean in Latin? Uh, I'll never ask you that. So you can decide whether you need to know this or not. Um, scientists are perfectly human possibly except for this guy on the slide, Dr. Milo T. Pinkerton of the New Orleans Rock Band Consortium of Genius, who's well worth a listen. We're not free from prejudices. Uh, we're not free of preconceived notions. We really, really, really want our hypotheses to be confirmed, and it's disappointing when they're not. Someone once said that the great tragedy of science is a beautiful hypothesis killed by an ugly fact. It happens. If you're a good scientist, you know this, and you try to build experiments that eliminate as much of your own bias as possible. You, know, you try to design your experiment in such a way that the bias that you have, you're not free from it, the bias that you have has as little chance as possible of affecting the results that you get. You know, it's very, it's, scientists sometimes get the reputation of being, you know, these kind of, you know, unfeeling, strictly logical Vulcans on Star Trek or something like that. And it's just not true. People don't function that way. And we're people. What we can do is know that we're likely to have biases and then try to design our experiments in such a way that we're not letting them influence our results. And I'll show you a great example from history. Um, okay, 19th century in America, the 1800s, uh, up until the Civil War, we've got African slavery. Uh, after that, conditions don't really improve for a lot of African Americans. Uh, you know all of this. And most 
Americans at the time were convinced that Africans were mentally inferior. And these scientists presented scientific arguments to prove it. Uh, this is from a scientific work uh, from 1854. Uh, Josiah Knott and Samuel Glidden measured a whole bunch of skulls from different racial groups, uh, whites, blacks, Native Americans, and measured how big they were and measured um, you know, the volume of the brain inside and this, that, and the other, and added it all up and put in a whole bunch of charts demonstrating that Europeans had the biggest brains and the greatest intelligence uh, groups like Asians and Native Americans came in lower and Africans were down at the very bottom. Uh, so there you've got, you know, up at the top, uh, that's, a, uh, that's a Roman sculpture of the god Apollo, because of course all white people look exactly like that. Um, there's an African down below. Uh, next to them you can see the skulls. And clearly you can see that the African skull is smaller and the jaws stick out more. Although actually they don't, uh, the African skull has just been drawn tilted uh, to make it look like the uh, forehead is lower and the jaws stick out. Uh, there's a trick there in how the skulls are drawn. But 19th century scientists were convinced of this. And in 1906, a Virginia doctor named Robert Bennett Bean uh, took a collection of preserved brains, uh, 152 brains that had been taken from dead bodies and pickled. And he measured the sizes of various parts of brains uh, from both blacks and whites. Uh, he found that for a particular part of the brain, white folks had larger parts than black folks. If you want to get technical, what he was measuring was the ratio of the size of a part of your central brain uh, called the splenium to the part of another size of the brain called the genu. Uh, those are parts of the giant. Sorry, Brendan, I lost you there. Okay, Brennan, all I heard was static, I'm afraid. Dr. Wagner, is it all right if I head out? I, uh, yeah, I'm almost done. I'm okay. almost done, I promise. But okay. yeah, if you need to split, you can. But everybody else, hang in there for just one minute more. So Bennett Bean found that this part of the brain was bigger in whites than in blacks, and he argued that this has to do with intelligence. And if you look at this graph, the light colored circles are mostly up above the dark colored squares. That's white brains above black brains. Bean's professor was suspicious and he measured another sample of brains, but did it without knowing what race they came from. Each brain was just given a code number and he didn't find out until after he'd made the measurements whether the brain came from a white or a black person. And when he did that, the difference vanished. Uh, these dots are completely overlapping. There's no difference between black and white brains. Dr. Bean already believed that black folk would have smaller brains than whites. And his measurements reflected that. You know, he probably, when measuring the brains of people he knew to have been European, you know, there's always a tendency to fudge it just a little bit and maybe we'll round this guy up just a little more, give him an extra millimeter or so. He may not even have known he was doing that. And when measuring the brains from black folk, he may have, oh, just a little bit, you know, round that down just a little bit. You know, he may not even have been conscious he was doing it but he ended up getting those very biased results. But when you take that out of the equation, when you don't know whether you're measuring black or white brains, the difference vanishes. There is no significant difference uh, between the brains of different racial groups or of the intelligence of different racial groups. So that's a way of making sure that your own biases 
don't contaminate your results. And when you're testing drugs, they're usually done double blind to ensure that neither your patients nor the doctor knows who got the placebo and who got the real drug. And that's to make sure the doctor treats all of his patients exactly the same and doesn't bias the experiment by maybe treating the ones who got the drug differently from the ones who got the placebo. Okay, by the power vested in me by the state of Arkansas, we're going a little long. Uh, so I will stop there and I will uh, stop the recording now.